All right, guys, so a lot of you want to know um, about EMPs um, and, like, how you would survive one with minimal damage to your electronics and how to basically still be able to have power via a generator. If you are looking online, make sure you're reading the date because a lot of them are saying your generator will be okay, but the date is back years ago. Now we've got circuit boards in every freaking generator. So let's talk about portables, all right? Because every standby, any generator that is fixated on the side of the house or at a commercial industrial business is gonna have multiple circuit boards, okay? The only ones that don't, unless there's a weird EMP resistant and you've got a, a, a crazy Faraday cage around the generator, you're done. You're not, it's not gonna work. So check it. The older generators, I'm saying probably from the 19, or probably like 2000s, 2010, uh, basic pull starts only are gonna have no uh, circuit board. Um, if you don't have a circuit board in there, you're good to go. Like there's a ton of them. I, you can buy used ones all day on micro, uh, Facebook marketplace. Um, you don't want one that has a, uh, LED screen, a LCD screen that shows you information that usually means it's going to be more higher tech and have a circuit board in it. You don't want that. Uh, that's where it will get affected and it will not work. Um, if you have just a basic pull start um, generator, it won't get affected by the uh, EMP, electromagnetic pulse. Um, some ways to protect your devices. And so this is the thing. The typical person is not gonna be able to do this because they're not, number one, gonna be able to afford it. Say you wanted your phone to work, even though if the lines are down, you know, tower, signal, all that, you're done. Your car, you want your car to work? Ultimately, you gotta know the EMP is coming and have it put in a Faraday cage or, which a lot of the rich, rich people are doing 100%. They're buying spare electrical parts for their vehicles, like the ECM. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, honestly. But to have power to produce voltage, you absolutely need a basic generator, portable generator that doesn't have any circuit boards, doesn't have any smart monitoring systems. Um, inverters will not work. They're completely made up of circuit boards and circuitry to actually produce the, uh, to invert, you know, DC to AC. <clears throat> Literally goes AC to DC to AC on an inverter. And um, that's how it allows the gen to run at a slower uh, RPM and still produce the correct voltage. Um, and through rectifiers and whatnot. You have to, um, so basically, let's just say walkie talkies uh, have a circuit board in it, you know? You would have to put those in a Faraday box. You can buy them online. Pe there's companies that, you know, specialize in creating Faraday cages, Faraday boxes for storing important material. Um, my, the microwave is actually a good thing too. Now, to test it, put your phone in the microwave. Do not turn the microwave on or you will mess your phone up. Go get your family member, your friend's phone and or have someone try and call your phone while it's in the microwave. It'll probably, if it doesn't ring and it goes to voicemail like you don't have signal, then it's an effective Faraday cage. Um, tin foil, basic shit. You can do tin foil uh, wrapped around the device. Put cloth material, you know, some soft material. Wrap it around and then wrap it with tin foil. 
um, at the minimum three times. You want to have the thickest tin foil that you can buy. I would wrap it fucking ten times if I were you. I'd wrap it ten times, and um, and and to effectively protect it, it needs to be grounded. It needs to have a direct path to ground. And so, what happens there? Okay, tin foil is conductive. The non-conductive material that you, you know, the soft material, the cloth, whatever that you're wrapping around the device is non-conductive. And so when you have a ground path, the EMP, the magnetic pulse will hit your tin foil and go to the path of least resistance, which is always going to be a path directly to ground. If you don't have one, then basically the pulse will hit the tin foil and it will be a more concentrated pulse of the electromagnetic force that might make its way through the cloth and damage your, your uh, cell phone, your whatever. So the millionaires and billionaires are going to have their garage EMP proofed. It'll basically be a huge Faraday cage. You might even have the billionaires have their house Faraday caged basically. And you would never notice because it's not like you're going to have, it's not like you're going to see like fucking, you know, crazy shit wrapped around the house. It's going to be in the insulation type deal, right? So keep that in mind. Um, if you wanted stuff to survive, you basically need a secondary part, you know, whatever. You want a phone to survive? Well, then you're going to have to have a phone that is in a Faraday cage or a Faraday Faraday storage box at all times because, number one, you never know when, the, when we're going to get hit. It's not like, oh, guys, hey, it's on its way. Uh, get ready, you know. So that's why I saw people, oh... Like, how would we know when it's cut? Obviously, you don't. And obviously, you're not going to be protecting the one that you're using. You would need to have secondary backups that are protected. Um, a metal trash can with a metal lid is an okay Faraday cage. Um, basically, a Faraday cage is any, any metal any um it's not any material that will it, that is conductive and and so what that does is since it's conductive the EMP the mag electromagnetic force is going to be attracted to that right and the main thing is, okay, it's attracted to that, not the device, but the secondary part of it all is you have to have an, a, an amazing insulation wrapped around the device. You can't just have a device with tin foil wrapped around it because the device is going to touch the tin foil and bam, it's done. But if that tin foil has a layer if, if the device has a layer between the tin foil that is non-conductive, it's insulation, then it will not get damaged. Do you get what I'm saying? Awesome. So, get yourselves a basic ass generator. Um, not anything new. Not anything new. Promise you very easily to tell if your generator has circuit boards or not <laughs> wherever you see the outlets and maybe your key switch or you've got the pull cord but wherever the outlets are take the screws out pull that down if you don't see any circuit boards you're good to go reason being you don't have a circuit board in a lot of them is because there's not a lot of sensors there's not logic there's not a controller to turn something on. It's a switch. It's analog. It's not digital. You can have digital, but then you've got a circuit board. 
okay? All the big generators are digital, um, and that's why they've got multiple circuit boards, because they're inputs and outputs. Um, the basic ones is basically an on-off, and the off interrupts the ground going to the ignition coil, which causes spark. And all you need is what? Spark, air, and fuel. So you got fuel, you got air, spark, okay. As long as you pull it, it's gonna run, okay? Now, the, the newer stuff uses um, mag pickups, which um, is a pulse that it gets from the flywheel teeth, which will help regulate the frequency, yada, yada, yada. It's not, they're gonna be damaged. So get an old generator. And I'm not talking old, I'm just saying 2005s. Make sure it's a basic one with just the pull capacity. That's really what will save your ass is you find something that's just pull start with no monitoring system, no buttons to go throughout the screens and look at certain um, specs, you know, then you know it's basic and it's basic enough. With that, once we get hit, we're good. You go hook up the generator and it'll start up. Okay? Um, I highly recommend having a conversion kit installed. If you don't have a dual fuel generator, which a lot of the new generators are dual fuel, but they have the circuit boards. I install the dual fuel conversion kits and I do it on a lot of the older ones and then you're good. Reason I want and say to get dual fuel is uh, propane is the way to go. You can get a hundred gallon, 200, 300, 400, 500. 500, like they're big, right? You would need to get permitting once you get to a certain size if you want it in the ground. But a hundred gallon is the same circumference as a grill propane tank, it's just like five feet tall. And the aluminum ones are extremely light. You'd be so surprised. Even the steel ones though, anyone can fucking move that around and, sh and, and stuff. They're not like 200 pounds, but you get an aluminum one, that thing is easy. Um, and, and so that allows a lot more runtime because think about it. Think about this. Say it's gasoline. Okay, you run out. Say you do all of this shit, right? And you like, oh, I my my car, I had, a e, I had an extra ECM, or I had an old school automobile, didn't have any of that, all that BS circuitry. So you're driving, you're driving to the gas station. Well, guess what? Guess what runs the pumps? at the gas station, circuits, they're not gonna be pumping. Um, you know what I mean? Now you would have to like literally go on some Rambo shit and siphon out fuel somehow from the pump, you know, like literally cutting the hose type shit, but they have solenoids and safeties in, in a place that are far down near the tank that are gonna stop fuel and so you wouldn't even really you'd be able to like suck out fuel that are like in the line so you're not gonna get much now if you have the external fuel tanks that you know are above ground and it's like a gas fuel tank like you would see propane tanks that are on the side of buildings and shit if you had like one of those you know an external gasoline tank an external gas storage tank you're good um, but so keep that in mind. All right. That's how you would survive. You want an old school generator that is not fancy inverters, not going to work home standby units that are on the side of the houses, not going to work. They have controllers, right? Cause they're automatic. Like if they lose power, they're going to sense power loss through the controller and uh, that right there is exactly what will stop their generator from uh, it'll be damaged from the from the damage the the pulse 
Um, so keep that in mind, guys. If anyone, you know, is honestly doing shit to just be, if they can afford to, hey, I don't like, you know, what ifs. I can afford it. I, you know, I'm going to do this anyways, just in case. I hope this information helps you. I hope that you maybe maybe learn something. I hope that if you're rich enough, you can send me a million dollars. My address is 901. No, I'm kidding. I'm not freaking out like, oh God, like, oh shit. Like I thought I saw a fucking bomb. Like, but the way the world is like, I don't fucking see us really making it too much farther with just how fucked up every everyone is i mean dude smoke a joint and like peace and love and and harmony man anyways guys i'll catch you on the next one let me know if there's anything specific you want to talk about um an electric i uh i graduated an electrical apprenticeship program many years ago i'm very very good electrically um you know, both sides, the whole schooling side and knowing um, any sort of it like, you know, if you want to find out your voltage drop, I can tell you and show you how to remember that, um, you know, a thousand amperage length to distance. So you know, Ohm's law, very easy. And then the whole residential and actually the whole application of wiring and the wires and 480, 277, three phase, single phase, how to check phase rotation. I got you. Um, but that is how ultimately you will be able to have power when no one else does. And you, it's going to be crazy. If this ever happened, you'll, you know, the poorer people will have power because they'll have those basic gens. The rich people with the standbys will not have power unless they watch this video and buy a, a backup portable basic. So stay safe and I will see you on the next video. Peace.